the title of this conversation is Sebastian Folk's His Enduring Obsession with Love and War. I'm not sure that enduring obsession is necessarily accurate, but certainly love and war, those two themes, are absolutely central in your fiction. There are passionate love affairs in all your novels, and I think, and there are um, vivid depictions of war in many of them, most famously, of course, in Birdsong, set in the First World War, and in Charlotte Grey, set in the Second. But your fiction also includes a very wide range of other topics and periods. There's a novel set in Vienna in the 1890s. There's one set in Washington in the 1950s. There's one set in Italy, a story in the future in the 2020s. And your novel Engleby is, takes place inside the head of a psychopath. Uh, but before we talk about the contents of your novels, I'd like to ask you a bit about what made you want to be a full-time novelist after you'd been a very successful journalist. And for example, what do you think of what one of your heroes, P.G. Woodhouse, has said, which is that uh, there's no agony greater than the agony of literary composition? Is that how you experience it? Uh, well, uh, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> I, I'm mindful of another thing that P.G. Woodhouse said, um, which is uh, my wife was kind enough to point out to me yesterday. Uh, when uh, Bertie Wooster comes across what he calls as a lady novelist, and he says, the wretched woman spent an hour explaining to us how she'd written her book. A brief apology would have done the job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was at uh, Cheltenham uh, last weekend as a, just watching from the audience, and it really made me realize uh, what, how critical audiences at literary festivals are. Uh, I wandered out from having seen a novelist interviewed and said, um, I thought he was pretty good, didn't you? And the people I was with said, oh, God, I thought he was utterly charmless. <laughs> and then there was a panel discussion about something. I said, that was really interesting, wasn't it? And this American friend said, no, they just picked a low-hanging fruit. <laughs> so I'm feeling rather on my best behavior, especially having come on stage to music. Um, <laughs> And very keen not to bore people with sort of endless ruminations about how I write and so on and so forth. But I, I do actually, to answer your question finally, uh, I, I love writing and it can be tiresome, uh, it can be difficult and it can make you uh, depressed and um, frustrated. But I'm completely addicted to it and if I don't um, write a certain number of words a day, if I'm not involved in a project, I tend to become rather depressed and downcast. And I've just finished a book and I'm now slightly feeling, oh God, I wish I had something to work on. And I have been a full-time writer on my own in the cork-lined room now for 26 years since I left journalism in 1991. And I am actually quite keen to get a job. But the trouble is I'm now unemployable. And, and journalism where I used to work has moved on to the extent that I wouldn't really be able to work there anymore, I don't think. And I wrote this sort of plea for help in a diary in the Spectator magazine of about two years ago, saying I need a job, and it just caused tremendous merriment. The uh, Londoner's Diary and the Evening Standard thought this was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. And I was offered two jobs, though. One was um, uh, a solicitors in Islington uh, said, would I like to rewrite the content of their website? And another, I think, offered to me in all sincerity by a crime writer called Sophie Hanna, asked if I'd like to do some dog sitting for her. <laughs> This, this, the dog, I'm sure, charming, wasn't really the sort of colleague I had in mind. Um, so, uh, you know, one is stuck with it. But, um, you know, how many more, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, dog walking, apparently, is now the, the, the latest thing in, in job, in job um, yeah. jobs for people. But anyway, but, I mean, very often, in the, particularly in the past, but even now, people regard reading novels as a rather sort of inferior, self-indulgent activity compared, say, to reading history books or philosophy or poetry. What is your view of that? 
Uh, I've never uh, felt that, um, and maybe because uh, novels just had such a sort of profoundly explosive uh, effect on my life when I was about 14. Um, I was a rather shy, unhappy child at a boarding school, uh, and I then one term was given to read David Copperfield, Pride and Prejudice, Sons and Lovers, and my world sort of changed overnight. Principally, I realized that every other human being in the world had an inner life. I thought up until that point only <laughs> I had an inner life, and everyone else was just a sort of aggregation of facial features and sort of size and hair and attitudes and annoying behaviors which are out to prevent me having a nice time. And to begin with, this was an almost unbearably weighty discovery to think that everyone has an inner life which is rich, complex, vulnerable, confused, um, and I didn't really know what to do with it, actually. But it was also fantastically, it enlarged my whole view of life, and it enabled me to get on with people a bit better and to sort of begin to communicate with them. And I don't really understand how people who haven't read George Eliot and Jane Austen and um, D.H. Lawrence and uh, Dickens and so on, how, how do they know what other people think and feel? Yeah, I agree, yep. Because you can't tell from what people tell you, because most people, especially in this country, are quite reserved and don't wish to tell you exactly, or they're not eloquent enough, they don't have the words. And one odd thing about English is that although it has this huge vocabulary, huge in terms of size, the number of words to describe feelings and compounds of feelings are actually terribly limited. It's as though one was trying to describe a particular shade of color and you only could use the words brown, green, red. Uh, you know, what do you feel about someone? It's a compound of about 40 different emotions and so on. And one of the things a novel can do is take you inside the life of someone and, and you can see their feelings developing and, and then you kind of almost intuit what they feel. So as for reading novels being a, an inferior form of reading, uh, I, don't, I don't feel that, but it may just be because that's my sort of personal uh, story. Um, they've, they've changed my life and enhanced my life beyond measure. Of course, there's also that famous... Um, but in, I think it's Northanger Abbey, isn't it, where someone criticizes Jane Austen's heroine and says, oh, just reading a little novel, are you? And she says something like, oh, only the work in which the greatest insight into human nature is displayed, only the form in which, and there's this great yes, long yes, riff, yes, so yes, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm yes, with her right, on that. Right, yeah. right. Good, well, let's get back to uh, Love and War mm. and your own novels. And let's start with Love. Yeah. In one of your novels, you say that uh, love between two people is pretty much the, um, the defining experience of being human. But somewhere else you also say that um, literature has kind of elevated love to a rather unrealistic position in ordinary life. Do you think these are contradictory statements or, or can they, are they both true? Um. I think the great thing about being a novelist is you don't have to have a position. Uh, you can just um, you can put an idea out there and you can play around with it and let and and you dramatise it in the lives of your characters, uh, and you let people draw their own conclusions about it. I mean, undoubtedly, um, for many people, uh, love, being in love, is the sort of is a transcendent experience. It's one of the few times in their life they get outside the the restrictions and bonds of the everyday of, and of the limitations of their own personality and their own character, which many people find so depressing. Um, and there's a little bit at the end of the book I've written now in which the a boy realizes that the girl has fallen in love with him and he says, um, I realize that um, she, she was viewing me as someone I was not and she had this view of me as some sort of hero. And it was an extraordinary liberation because in order to become this hero, I realized all I had to do from now on was be myself. <laughs> and th there's that sort of strange paradoxical thing, which is extraordinarily inspiring and a wonderful thing. But um, undoubtedly, uh, I think literature has given an enormous amount of weight um, to these experiences and finding the right person and so on because it gives a sort of shape. And one of the great things that novels do uh, is they give a shape and a sense of meaning and purpose to people's lives, which they don't really have. I mean, Howard Jacobson was talking this morning about just hoping not to reach the end of his life and die and think, God, what was all that about? Whereas when you reach the end of a good novel, you think, ah, oh, that was what it was all leading up to. This, it makes kind of sense. And um, 
and so on. So, uh, and also the other thing, of course, is that, I mean, love is just an emotion. It's like envy or resentment or anger or excitement. It's an emotion, you know, in your brain, certain pathways have been fired. But it's an emotion which has a place in our legal system. Uh, you know, marriage and the you know, protection of, uh, of this bond and relationship and what it means for children is enshrined in the heart of, you know, of many laws and so on in a way that uh, envy or resentment is not the cause of any law so far as I'm aware. Not in a good sense, of course. Uh, I mean, you know, violent feelings are legislated against. But so, you know, love has, has this, this sort of slightly enthroned um, position in our life, which is... Well, that's the way it is. I mean, I don't have to believe one thing or another, really. Do I, I, mean, I was quite surprised this morning when mm. uh, Howard Jacobson was talking about what does one think about at the end of one's life mm. and when one's dying, mm. not to be too morbid uh, on this occasion. Mm. And he said um, he, he never mentioned love. And mm. yet, you know, as Philip Larkin said, um, the, uh, the re whatever it is, um, all that remains of us is love. And I think when one is, you know, it seems to me that actually... Uh, it, it, it does represent, as you say, the, um, the essence of being human when all is said and done. But anyway... But what what um, Larkin actually says is believing yes. our almost instinct almost true, what will remain <laughs> yes, of us is love, so true. quite hedged around. <laughs> yes, but, yes, that's yeah. true. Well, in your... There are all these love affairs in your books, and the sort of assumption seems to be that uh, people have one great love of their life, mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work out, they've had it. I mean, in your latest book, actually, uh, the, uh, Where My Heart Used to Beat, the um, hero, as a young man, meets an Italian girl, falls in love with her, and then it turns out she's already married, so they have to part. And that's it. Uh, he never gets over it. And for the rest of his life, he's kind of mourning this and can't get a pro doesn't have another proper relationship. <laughs> And is that how you see it works, or do you think that just makes a better dramatic story? That's, that's his pathology. I mean, that's, his, that, that's the way that character works. And I mean, uh, where my heart used to beat, I mean, that is very much an essential part of it. Um, his feeling that Louisa is, was the only woman with whom he could possibly be happy, have a life, and he prefers to just seal off the avenues of affection after she's gone. Though, spoiler alert, I know there's someone here who's just started the book this morning. They do meet again later on. Uh, I, would, I was always slightly frustrated in The Age of Innocence, the Edith Wharton book, uh, when the main character goes to Paris and he looks up at the window where the woman he, who is the love of his life is, and he thinks, shall I go up after all these years and see her again? And in the end, with great Eswardian restraint, he turns and walks away. And I just, I, I slightly wanted to rewrite that. So my, my hero goes to the, uh, the hotel in the ski resort where Louisa is. He looks up and he does walk away, a la Edith Wharton. And then he goes to a bar in the village and he thinks, oh, fuck it. And he, <laughs> and he goes back. And I was so uh, extraordinarily uh, difficult but very exciting to write the scene as you know he looks at himself in the mirror in the lift as it's going up and thinking oh my god you know what do I look like after all these years what's she going to look like and then the doors open and he sees the door the bedroom door open at the end of the corridor and he sees her unmistakable figure coming towards him not very well lit and then in the light of her bedroom he sees what she actually looks like oh I'm feeling quite choked up talking about <laughs> um, but um, so that is predicated on, on that possibility. And undoubtedly, what, what really hurts people when their love affairs break up and go wrong is this desperate sensation that it was him, it was her, and no one else, and there cannot, there yes. cannot yes. be a replacement. Yes. Yes. Now, that may be an illusion, or it may be a delusion. It may be wrong in, in many ways, but that is certainly what hurts. hurts. Um, however, having said that, in the new book I've written, which uh, is now out for a year, um, so you can't buy it, um, so this is not a sales pitch, but um, the, the, one of the main characters in that is a 32-year-old American academic in Paris, and the book is set in Paris. Indeed, it's called In Paris, so you know what it's, what it's about. Uh, she has had a very difficult uh, relationship at the age of 21 when she's very young and she's been very mistreated by a man and she's 10 years later, she's come back to Paris where all this happened, and she's trying to sort of deal with it. And she still hasn't got over him. 
Uh, and she's, but she's a very busy, earnest academic woman, and uh, one day she's going to do an important interview in Paris, but she has this dream about her old lover. And uh, she then puts a point of view which is, may surprise you. She says, um, I couldn't allow him to derail my work at this moment, so I had to confront, for a moment at least, the power he still seemed to wield, to face him down. But at once my mind began to wander. Suppose there are six billion people in the world, three billion of each sex. Of these, perhaps one billion were over 50 and one billion under 22. So I had one billion potential mates, allowing for the fact that many of them wouldn't like me at all, nor I them, and being as choosy as a reasonably sane and halfway friendly person might be, could you narrow it down to say one in a hundred of that group, picky or what? But even that still left, and I checked the figure on a piece of paper, 100 million attractive men I could have had a reasonably happy life with. My guess, only a guess, was that few women in fact narrowed it down that far. Many, I suspected, were content with number 567,297,441. But anyone in your top 50 million was going to lead to something dangerous. Then, suppose by the most unlikely chance you came across a man in your top million, or thousand, or hundred. What then was the capacity for pain? And what, dear God in heaven, if he'd been in your earthly conceivable top ten? I hardly dared to picture number one himself. That moment he was probably chopping trees in a Venezuelan jungle, in a loincloth and a sweaty headband, <laughs> unaware of his unique importance. <laughs> when I'd finished this calculation, I felt better. But then I saw the logic I'd been using. I hadn't for a moment thought that the narrowing of the odds would bring me happiness as I came closer to the platonic after other half of me, the Venezuelan logger. No, I had assumed that the person I most loved would most utterly destroy me. And what, as my therapist would have asked in her Boston drawl, does that say about you, Hannah? Um, so... <laughs> So, you know, be careful what you wish for. I mean, it sort of cuts, <laughs> cuts all ways, doesn't it? It does, um. yes. Also, there are all these fictions, like, as in, dare I say, Proust, where, where he falls madly in love. It goes on and on and on. It turns out to be complete delusion or illusion. And he yes. suddenly thinks, what on earth have I been doing for this yes. woman who I don't even like? But yes. anyway, forget that. But it's well known, actually, that the more you love you have in your novels... Mm -hmm the better they sell, particularly to women, if one can say that nowadays. Do you, does that come into your calculations at all? No, I've never um, really calculated what might make a book sell. And I think that I know a lot of writers who started off trying to write great serious books and they sold three copies. And then they said, I'll just make it a little bit more popular by doing this. And they then fall apart completely. Yes, yes, yes. And for some reason, I've been very fortunate and I've only ever written exactly what I want to write. And people have, been, uh, people have bought it. And I just really have a sort of massive superstition now that if I, I mean, why would I want to? Um, anyway, I've just got away with it so far. Um, but in fact, I'm not sure that all my novels do have love in, do they? Um, they certainly don't all have war in. I mean, you mentioned oh, Charlotte Grey, but there's only, there's only one yes. shot fired in Charlotte Grey. I didn't say that. I said many of them have war. Ah, okay. I did, yes. Um, but uh, a lot don't. Um, you know, on Green Dolphin Street, the war is in the background. It's the no, Cold oh, War. Oh, sure, yes, yes, yes. Engleby, yes. there's no war. Actually, there's no love in Engleby either. Um, well, sort of, yes. Well... The word, in Engleby, the word love only occurs once, and it's the last word of the book, which is supposed to give it an extra little resonance. And as you close it, I don't expect any reader has ever said to themselves, God, that's the first time the word love has, has arisen in this book. But maybe subliminally, they close it feeling quite freaked out, because it's a pretty freaky story. But I hope that at some level they may register that love, or in fact, the absence of love through, through the preceding 250 pages has been, um, been part of the problem. Yes, but one does point. feel that he sort of loves, is it Jennifer? Is that yeah. Yes. One does feel all the time that that's what's wrong, that he, he both can and, and can't love, but, yeah. but, you know, but she's sort of... He, well, he little, desires her. He wants yes. to own her and have her, but I, yes. I wouldn't say yes. he really loves yes. her. Yes, yes. But, sorry, go on. No, no. We can go on about love, but I was going to no. say, let's, let's get on to war, yeah. <laughs> your other um, enduring obsession. Well, 
Do you want to go on about love some more? No, I've just kind of gone about semicolons, actually. It's it's very good fun playing these tiny little um, games with the reader. Having said that, I I never try and make something popular in a sort of crowd-pleasing way. At the same time, I spend an enormous amount of time trying to think how the reader is responding to what I'm writing. So in a book like Human Traces, which deals a lot with very complicated stuff about um, evolution and psychiatry and psychology, I spent years trying to simplify and simplify and simplify so I could bring the reader with me into quite difficult areas of speculation. Likewise, in A Week in December, which has quite a lot about the financial crisis in it, I spent a... I cut the amount of financial information by 50%, and I refined and refined and boiled it down and purified and reduced and tried again and again. So I do spend, I think, if I put this word here in the sentence, will it work better than here? Well, any any writer halfway worth her salt does that. But I will also hide a key word in the middle of a paragraph so the reader's eye doesn't catch it too soon. And so I, I... I didn't want to sound dismissive when I said I don't think about being popular. I think about pleasing the reader yeah, to an almost yes. whorish extent, um, you know, <laughs> because it is a collaboration. Yes. And one of the fascinating things to me about writing fiction is, is the sort of triangular relationship of the whole thing. So at the apex of the triangle, you have what it's about, what Engleby is doing, what Stephen is doing, what the characters are doing. And you're, you're directing the reader's attention to that. But you can also have a little conversation with the reader along the base of the triangle. And one of the things you're trying to do is to make the reader think that perhaps you've got it a bit wrong and make the reader think that she or he knows better than you do. And uh, I sometimes, very much in Birdsong, I wanted the reader to think that I, the author, was a completely ruthless person because I killed the nicest character in the book, who's <coughs> Stephen's great friend, Michael Weir, killed him with a stray sniper's bullet halfway through the book. So I'm building a relationship with the reader then, and it's a very uneasy relationship in which the reader is supposed to fear me, really. And that's because at the last sequence of the book, when Stephen is strapped underground, I don't want the reader to think, yeah, but the hero always gets out. They want them to think the hero usually gets out, but this guy is such a (laughs) bastard that I can't rely on that. So, you know, that's this relationship you have with the reader. Well, I think that reading birds... Birdsong is about as close as one can get to actually experiencing the uh, horrors and tragedies of war oneself. And I just wondered how you managed uh, to make it so, uh, so extremely sort of graphic and, and immediate. How do you manage to make war so realistic and, and, and upsetting? Um. I suppose, really, it was by um, concentrating on small details. Uh, I know very little about um, troop movements or, you know, cat badges. Uh, I mean, I have a sort of vague understanding of the sort of big picture history of the First World War. But I spent an enormous amount of time in the Imperial War Museum um, reading individual documents when uh, many of these men died um, either during the war or if they survive many years later, often in the 1950s, 60s, their, their families would donate a whole pile of letters, postcards, and so on to the Imperial War Museum. And, and through these, you got a much better texture of you know, how often you got to have a bath or a shower, how, how many days you were actually in the trench under fire compared to how many days you'd be in reserve, what might you do, what were the friendships like, how often did you write home, what could you write, what cigarettes did you smoke? <coughs> what brands were they? How did you wash? What did lice feel like? How did you get rid of them? All these sort of details. And so it was by sort of focusing tightly on these realistic details, yes, which yes. I suppose is a, it's what Flaubert sort of taught you, really, um, as he's describing Emma with her lover in their ridiculous sort of love nest. He focuses on the the slightly banal, slightly ridiculous details of the the bedhead, the knocker, the fire irons, the chair, to make it all seem so down to earth compared to Emma Bovary's ridiculous romantic fantasies. <laughs> yes. uh, so I sort of copied him yes. to some extent, I think. Well, you've written, I think, brilliantly about love and, uh, sorry, about war. And um, Dr. Johnson has said somewhere that um, every man feels meanly about himself if he hasn't been a soldier. And I just wondered whether 
your very intense writing about war was in some ways possibly a substitute for actually becoming a soldier yourself, whether you felt that in the generation that we live in, no one was sufficiently tested or their endurance, their courage wasn't put to the test, and whether you, perhaps by writing about it, you know, engaged in that activity. Well, I have you know, I did serve seven terms in the school combined cadet course, (laughs) (laughs) reaching the rank of leading aircraftsman. Um, But, uh, I mean, I suppose the whole question about war, really, people say, you know, are you obsessed by war? Why do you write so much about it? To which my answer is I don't write that much about it, actually, and I reeled off all these books that have no war in them. But um, the real question to me is why, why did no one else write about it? Yes, I mean, the 20th yes. century was completely defined by its wars, alas. Um, and I remember reading books when I was first hoping and thinking that I might one day aspire to write books myself, so reading novels in the 60s and 70s. Uh, all of the characters in um, Kingsley Amos or Iris Murdoch and so on, they must have been of an age to have had something to do between 1939 and 1945, but was never alluded to. I mean, incredibly seldom. Yes. Uh, it was as though that was something that hadn't happened, or let's not go there. But my feeling was on the contrary, it had happened. And I suppose to some extent that was just the way I, the world in which I was born. I was born in 1953. My father would do the mow the lawn in his old army trousers. And when I was about five, he went into the hospital to have some shrapnel taken out of his arm, which had worked its way down over the years. And the, the, the teacher in our little village school um, had uh, one arm useless and one leg useless, where he'd been shot through the head in a tank in Sicily. And this was simply the world one grew up in. And then in about 60, 61, the Russians put a man in space. And my brother and I were very, very excited about this. Um, you know, rockets, daddy. And, but my father wasn't that pleased about it. And, you know, why? Why would you not be excited about Yuri Gagarin orbiting the Earth? And he said, well, it shows the Russians, the Soviet Union no, my, may now be ahead in, this, in the space race and then the arms race. And then one got a sense of a, this Cold War, which was about to envelop us. Then Kennedy was assassinated. And then there was the Cuban Missile Crisis before that, and all the teachers walking around with a long face. So I was just bought, born as everyone in my generation was, into a world of war. That's simply what happened. And my grandfather had been at the Somme. My grandfather was killed in 1945 as a reporter with the American forces crossing the Rhine. I never met him, obviously, because he was killed before I, I died. And, you know, so I didn't really understand why it's so weird that one would want to write about the world that you find. Uh, and I assumed I would fight in, in the Third World War when it came, which it looked in many points in the 1960s and indeed 70s, as though it, as though it might. Um, and I think that about the time I first conceived this idea of wanting to be a writer, it's about the time of sort of like adolescent turmoil when you stop having that child's urge to normalise everything and to think everything's OK. You think, actually, it's not OK. It's not okay that my father's still got German shrapnel in his arm. It's not okay that, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis has taken us to the brink of nuclear annihilation. And, you know, uh, who are we? How did we get to this? And I think that's what a lot of my early books are about, really, just trying to understand the world in which I find myself. And although they're not at all autobiographical, uh, they are, I suppose, I can now see in retrospect, deep down, they are about trying to make sense of this world I suddenly became fully aware of at the age of about 18. Uh, And one of the things I concluded from that first run of books was that human beings were a very peculiar animal. And I then became quite interested in the evolutionary side of human beings and and why we are so mad. And then the next run of books I wrote were not about who we are, but what are we? And what is this creature? But as you've also written very directly about the persecution of Jews in the Second World War. I mean, there are, there are heart-rending scenes in Charlotte Grey of children being taken, Jewish children being put on a train to take them to their death. And also in A Possible Life, one of the heroes is forced to work along Nazis in a concentration camp, and he never quite recovers from this. Uh, you know, and what... And so, I can see, obviously, it was quite brave of you, I think, to 
write so unflinchingly about this. I haven't read any fiction where this is done quite so, quite so directly. Was there any particular thing that made you do that, or is it just part of because it happened? You know. Well, uh, I think it's part. It's part of wanting to understand, but. I mean, I did, uh, you know, not being Jewish myself, I had very considerable trepidation going into um, Jewish libraries in Paris and London and researching all these things. And I did originally think, uh, I mean, Charlotte Gray, which is about one of the themes of the book, is is a political theme about I mean, the, the French attitude towards the German occupation was initially very reasonable, and they got a much better deal than any other occupied country in Europe. But it was a sort of slow march of complicity, and it went from cooperation into collaboration, then into the French doing the Germans' dirty work for them, and then actually being rather competitive about the question of rounding up Jewish people, both refugees and French nationals. And it, this sort of dance of death, it is very interesting politically because it's just a moment when it's gone too far, but the moment it's gone too far, it's already too late. And it seemed to me that if I was going to show the full morality of this political story, I needed to show the end result. But then I thought, I am not qualified, I'm not able, I don't wish to do this. Uh, and then I thought, well, actually, the people in the, in the book who are going are children. And maybe if I were to tell the story of arriving through the eyes of a child, it might be not only um, would it be very harrowing, but it, it might actually show it in a light that was in some faint way illuminating, because it was so bizarre that the eyes of a child might be a way of showing the full strangeness and horror of it. Um, but it was a very difficult uh, bit to write, as you can imagine. And um, I fully expected to take it out again on the grounds that it was just too horrible. And I did say to the publishers, you know, is this too horrible? And I had canvassed various people's opinion. And they said, no, I think you've done it with, uh, you know, in good faith. Yes. I mean, I, I'm, I feel that everyone Jewish would be very grateful to you for doing this and putting it into your fiction. I certainly am, as a Jew. But I think it's, you know, more people will read your book than will read some history book about the subject. So it's good to have it out there. Um, but this sort of brings us to your third obsession, <laughs> which is psychiatry mm. and psychology, and the whole question of human consciousness and the sort of thin dividing line between normality and abnormality, mm. which you, which comes into quite a number of your books, but of course particularly into Human Traces, which yeah. I think is your most impressive and ambitious book, in which you manage somehow to combine a fictional plot with an enormous amount of psychiatric and medical expertise. So much so, actually, that when I was reading it, I kept thinking, you know, you could easily change career <laughs> and become a very sympathetic doctor in a psychiatric ward. Mm -hmm. you, you must think about that. But how did you... I mean, you must have done huge amounts of research to, you know, there's quite a lot of bits which quite, if one is squeamish, one couldn't quite read. You know, you knew exactly about operations and everything medical. Well, I just, uh, it was, a, you know, a fascination to me. Uh, you know, what, what is this creature? I mean, I, I think it began in a, this creature, Homo sapiens, I mean. Um, I think it began... A, a, Again, a lot of these things, they end up sounding rather academic and sort of intellectual, but actually it was quite a sort of personal thing to begin with, which was when I was young, um, the, my godfather, my godmother's son uh, developed schizophrenia when he was about 21, the classic time. And there was very little uh, sympathy or understanding or treatment for him. He just grew his hair into a great big sort of Afro shock, which was long before such things became um, fashionable. And people said he's got something called paranoid schizophrenia with delusions of grandeur. And then other people would say, is he really ill? Or was it all in his mind? And, and even as a kid, I could see that was a logically a false antithesis. Uh, and I think I was fascinated. And then, sadly, uh, when I was at school, a very gifted boy who was at school with me, he developed schizophrenia at an incredibly young age, actually. And then a boy around the corner um, developed it and killed himself when he was 22. 
So I was just sort of aware of this. Uh, and then I read a very, very persuasive and very interesting paper by um, a professor called Tim Crow, um, which suggested that the genetic base of um, psychosis, schizophrenia particularly, was very closely related to the genetic changes that took place in the speciation of Homo sapiens. You know, the, when we divided from our, our fellow um, hominids. And, you know, that's just such a sort of hugely um, interesting, completely unproven as yet thing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a bit more than just, I mean, it's in evolutionary terms, what this means is that, uh, you know, the fact that one in a hundred of us doesn't work. I mean, it's a very, very high proportion. And in Darwinian terms, therefore, the, the, it must, for this genetic defect to have persisted, despite the fact that so many schizophrenic people take their own lives and they don't reproduce that as, as much as other people in the population, means that it must be very closely related to a very, very significant advantage in genetic terms. So, you know, that is also a fascinating uh, route to go down. So what is this advantage? Is it, It's a, probably something to do with consciousness. Uh, this uh, absurd consciousness we have, which is so hyper-developed, so completely unnecessarily developed, which is in itself a contradiction of Darwin, because really, uh, by the theory of you know, natural selection, in order to prosper and survive and fill our niche, all we needed to do was be a bit better at feeding and killing than the closest uh, person, the closest animal that was our competitor. We didn't need to have written all of Mozart or to have built Cliveden. I mean, that's just really an enormously unnecessary leap. And what it has burdened us with also, of course, is the knowledge of our mortality and the fact that we are dying, which is what the Spanish philosopher Uno Muno said as this, this curse of consciousness which makes us lower than the jackass or the crab. And it's not necessary, necessarily a superior way of living. It's just a curse. Um, it's actually, in, you know, when I look at our dog, I think in many ways he has a superior way of living. He's more fully engaged with the world, with the natural world, and with other creatures than we are. He doesn't know he's going to die. And he doesn't know he's going to die. So, you know, all these, these philosophical things come up, and then I, in Human Traces I, I put them into a, a narrative. And, you know, one of the big, the big, the live issue in psychiatry for quite a long time has been to what extent... Uh, is, uh, are things like schizophrenia biologically based? In other words, is there somewhere a submicroscopic particle somewhere in the genome you can say that's the cause? Or to what extent are they behaviorally based? In other words, anyone can go, to put it in lay terms, a bit mad if they have a horrible childhood. And, you know, we haven't got time to go into all that, but the answer is, to put it very simply, we don't know. <laughs> Though uh, I think I strongly believe that um, a lot of psychoses have a very strong biological and genetic uh, base. But uh, you can see why one might get interested in all this. And yes. then, of course, I was also very interested in early Freud, which is so ridiculous. <laughs> and <laughs> so shameful, so digs, shameful. Digs against Freud in your book, very yeah. amusing, actually. Yeah. Yes. Well, this, this, is, this is a man who uh, persuaded all these young women who came to him with various arrays of symptoms of pains in their tummy, pains in their heads, various things, that they were all suffering from uh, a repressed desire to sleep with their uncle or whatever it might be, and that they were suffering from something called hysteria, which is derived from the Greek for word for womb, hysteron, a womb. But then he'd extended it to a male hysteria, which he called traumatic hysteria, although men don't have wombs, so far as I know, for people who'd fallen off scaffolds, who clearly had head injuries. Uh, and he tried to relate that all back to their childhood and so on. And the, the worst case being this uh, young woman who came to him with a terrible pain in her tummy. And um, he cured her of her hysteria and showed her how she must come to grips with her erotic feelings for her stepfather. And six months later, she died of stomach cancer. And Freud's response to that was, it just shows you how protean a disease hysteria can be. <laughs> now, in any civilized country, that man would have been struck off or possibly imprisoned. Anyway, luckily his work did get better. Well, you obviously do a huge amount of research. For example, in your book, um, um, A Week in December, this, as you've mentioned, you, you, you did put in a lot about the banking crisis. Yeah. And actually, I want to ask you first something quite frivolous. I've recently read okay. your 
uh, James Bond book. You really I, have done your research, Mary. <laughs> well, this was very enjoyable. So <laughs> was your other um, pastiche, mm. which I really enjoyed even more, mm. which, because I'm a great P.G. Woodhouse mm. fan. But in your Bond book, James Bond goes off to various very exotic, well, he has to very exclusive restaurants and has exotic meals, such as um, uh, sweet and sour stuffed quail with rose petals. Yes, okay. this is your opinion. You so. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wondered whether, in the interest of research, yes. you went to these restaurants and, and tried, <laughs> tried to eat these things. No, um, but that was in, in, it was in Tehran, I think, wasn't in it? In Tehran, yes. Yeah. No, but luckily my wife has a good friend who comes from Tehran who's a very keen cook. <laughs> I see. And so I asked her. Okay. And uh, I right. also bought right. books on, um, you know, uh, Persian cooking, cookery. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so it's all done in your study. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so I, didn't even go, I didn't even go to Iran, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I, I, I do normally go to places um, and... You know, I wouldn't. I mean, for instance, in Human Traces, I went to Pasadena, Los Angeles, California. I went to the Maasai and you know, deep into parts of uh, Tanzania, and I found sort of remote places where human footprints had first been discovered by Mary Leakey and so on. And I went to Austria a lot because I was very serious about that. But I didn't really fancy going to the. Particularly, there's a scene in a border town between Iran and Afghanistan. And, but mercifully, it's a real bandit place, and I really didn't fancy that at all. It was only a page, but thank God the internet. You know, there, some yes. man has so sweetly walked through all the streets of this border town with a camera, and he, mm -hmm, yes. it was all there. I mean, the sounds, the sights, only the smell was lacking. Um, but no, I, I, I believe in doing well, the work. We're, we're sort of we? running out of time. I just want to ask Sorry, you yeah. one, one, before we have questions, yeah. I want to ask you, in, your, in this same book, which is a satire on... Well, I want to ask you two things. One is, in the satire of um, contemporary London, you have a, a This really, is uh, A Week in December. A Week in December. Yeah, yeah. You have a really nasty, vicious and vindictive uh, literary critic. Mm. Some people say he's based on someone who yes. I won't mention, and you deny this. But it, does this represent what you think of <laughs> <laughs> your average no. novel reviewer? Um, no, that character who's called uh, Tranter. Yes. Uh, the truth is, now it can be told, I think sufficient time has lapsed, that, there, that, that two anecdotes in A Week in December are taken from real life. And I broke a rule, a very strongly self-imposed rule in that. Um, and I, to be honest, I slightly regret it. Um, I, I always try to make everything up, but the, these two stories were just so great, I just couldn't resist them. And it became, therefore, slightly sort of journalistic, and it caused a bit of a to-do. And what I, I regret it because I broke my own rule of purity, uh, but I also regret it because it took people's eye off the important thing about that book, which was the crimes and misdemeanors and immorality of the financial system and financial yes. world. Yes. And people were so fussed about you know, is trying to, you know, so-and-so or so-and-so. Yes, yes, I yes. said, no, 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 that's not what the book is about. The, this book is about how a few thousand men and about three women stole your children's future and stuffed it in their back pocket. You need to care about this. Yes. And everyone said, yeah, I find those bits rather hard to follow, actually. <laughs> I spent well, months trying to make them clear. OK, we've got one, one and a half more minutes before mm. questions. So I just wanted to ask you, you haven't written a book, or at least it has been published for a year or two. Is there something coming? Have you been working on a, on a new book? I, I just finished one, actually. Um, the, for, the, for the extract I read earlier on with the woman going through the, the crunching the numbers, um, which is called, well, I'm not quite sure what it's called yet, but it'll have Paris in the title. In Paris, Paris Mirror, blah, blah, blah. Paris something. Paris France, Paris Trance, Paris Dance, Paris something. Um, which uh, it took me a while... Um, and it won't, it won't come out till next September. But, and I'll just very briefly tell you what it's about. Very briefly, there's nothing more boring than people telling you about books that they, ha they can't read. But I'll just tell you what the idea yes. is, and if you, if you say you hate the idea, then it's too late, so it's kind of like... <laughs> uh, 
I, I sit on this thing, the Government Advisory Committee for the Commemoration of World War I, which is sort of 30 very, very imposing people, former heads of NATO and defense secretaries, and, and I never say anything on this committee because I'm far too intimidated and shy and so on. But I did get to write the services for the commemoration of the Battle of the Somme on Centenary in July 2016. I wrote all the connective stuff and including a speech which was, I wrote actually for David Cameron, but was ended up being given by Prince William for reasons I don't fully understand, <laughs> but that's government. Um, and one of the things that we're on about is legacy, of course, and education and the youth and so on. And always very important to understand history. So young people, if you don't understand the past and you can't understand the present, you have no depth. And if you don't understand the past, you'll repeat the same mistakes. And as I was banging on about this for about the 30th person I'd met, I suddenly thought, oh, for God's sake, you sound like a sort of fifth form history teacher young people don't know history. Just deal with it. Uh, I don't know history. I mean, I never did a history O-level, let alone A-level. Uh, this is all just pompous nonsense. Are you really saying that people who know how everything is connected with everything else, and if you go to Paris, if you realize that this station is called that because of the siege of Paris, and this is a reference to this, and that's a reference to that, Austerlitz, Wagram, blah, 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 blah. Uh, or... That's just not how people live. Are you really saying that knowing a lot of history, knowing a lot of culture, knowing how everything is related to everything else <laughs> makes you a more worthwhile person who lives a better life? Or is it perfectly OK to just be a lively young person who bangs around like a pinball in a machine from one thing to another, having a good time, having a drink, having a smoke, and lusting after girls? And, well, I think I know what I think, but I'm just trying to, you know, dramatise this idea through the lives of two people in the book. But I, I, I do think, actually, I've, I've made it sound rather frivolous. I've rather undersold the book, maybe. It is quite seriously dealt with in the book. But I do think it is an interesting idea, especially because a lot of people will tell you now, oh, I don't need to know anything now because I've got a mobile phone. And they, they, they present this as though it's a great advance that everything that you used to have in here is now outsourced onto a piece of rather heavy stuff you have to carry around with you. Well, that's a choice, but it's not an advance. It's a regression, for sure. I agree, mm. yes, yes. Well, I think we should have a question now. Yeah. So who wants to ask something? There's a man at the back there, a woman. Woman. <laughs> um, hello. Um, I've wanted to ask this question since I first read Birdsong, so I'm delighted to be able to ask you. Um, when I first read it, I couldn't believe how amazing it was. It absolutely bowled me over. And once I'd got over that, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around how you as the author would deal with then going on and writing another book that was you know, going to be on a par or better than it. How, wh how, what was that experience like for you? Um, well, it was a difficult book to, to follow. It was the fourth novel that I'd written. And it, uh, initially, uh, everyone who read it said, this is fantastic, it'll win every prize, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't. It didn't even get mentioned in any prizes. And it wasn't a bestseller. And it rather sort of dwindled away. So, you know, that's, this, is, this is life, as Ronald Harwood, the playwright, said, you know, life is what well, a qualified disappointment, is the norm. Uh, but then when it came out in paperback, about a year later, it suddenly began to sell, and then it had that thing that publishers love, because it's so inexpensive for publishers, which is word of mouth recommendation, so they don't have to pay for the advertising. And so then it sold a, a prodigious number, which was wonderful, of course. But I didn't have an idea for another novel afterwards. And I was quite ill for a bit afterwards. I had pneumonia. And then I thought, well, I've got to write something. So I wrote a biography called The Fatal Englishman, um, which is three short lives put together into one book. And then gradually, you know, th I think most writers have this feeling with any book, let alone one that's rather life-changing, is that the sort of front of your mind, uh, Salman Rushdie was saying this last week in Charlton, is completely empty. There's just nothing there. I haven't an idea in my head now, and I had that very much then. But gradually, I remember having lunch with Anita Bruckner, to drop a name, but a rather Clivedonish name, I think, after I'd written a book called The Girl at the Lyon Door, my second book, which had, had wonderful reviews but sold, you know, half a dozen. And I said, uh, but I'll never write another book. I've said all I want to say now. 
And she said, smoking a sovereign cigarette, oh, you will, you will, you're a born writer, you will write another book. And somehow from somewhere stuff comes in and the more you do it, the more your brain begins to work in a kind of writery way and it begins to process information and shove it over there. You're unaware of this. That's maybe an idea and somehow it comes back. Um, anyone else? This gentleman at the front? Yeah. Do you um, have a report card on the various screen adaptations of your work? Do I have a report card on the various screen adaptations of my work? Um, uh, I don't, no. I don't really know what a report card looks like, except something that I think I had at school myself for being so lazy. Um, screen adaptations are... Um, there are there's, there's a complicated, it's a complicated thing. And... Um, I have had two adaptations, one uh, Charlotte Grey, which Kate Blanchett played, and one Birdsong on television, which Eddie Redmayne played. So I've been unbelievably lucky in the people who've played in them. Um, I have become very interested in the process, and I now, when I do an option deal for the development of something, I say that I, I will write it. And... Um, initially everyone said, well, that means no one will do it because no one wants the novelist hanging around like a sort of, you know, bad smell and saying, oh, no, you've got that wrong. But I said, fine, well, I'm just going to do it and that's the way it is. And anyway, I've written two other adaptations with a friend of mine, one of The Girl at the Lyon Door, one of On Green Dolphin Street, and they're both in development and have been for a long time. But people <laughs> like the script, but it's a fantastically complicated thing getting them away. Um, but I think what, you, what I never would want to be is the kind of person who hangs around saying they got it all wrong and so on, and um, I ain't going to do that. Kate, Eddie, thumbs up from me. <laughs> um. Thank you very much. Um, you've talked about your research quite a lot, and I wondered how much of an expert you have to, to be before you feel comfortable writing on a topic. And secondly, lots of your work touched on history and historical fiction. And I wondered, as a writer, particularly of popular historical fiction, where your role and sort of responsibility with regards to commemoration and communication of quite sensitive historical facts, well, truth, comes in, where you, where you feel your role and responsibility lies. Um, well, I think you have a responsibility to get the historical things right, um, absolutely right. And the the... The sort of the working the way that most people who write stuff with a with a historical background. I mean, I don't know if you heard Robert Harris this morning, um, but would be that everything that you say a historical character did or said, they did, and you know it's, you can present. I mean, I don't have historical characters in my book. I mean, once you have Napoleon came in and sat down and said come here, you're writing a different kind of popular historical sort of book, you know, station bookstall fiction uh, on the whole. Um, so this is a very rambly answer, isn't it? Uh, I, I just feel a responsibility to get the facts right, and then you can let your fictional invented characters play around as much as you like in the foreground. But I think getting a sense of getting you, the first part of your question, I like to... I have a sense of things being, of understanding things roughly, in order to give myself the confidence. And confidence is a massive part of, of writing fiction, not just fiction with a historical setting, but fiction with any setting. You sit down and you say, the woman came into the room, she opened the window, and she telephoned her friend, and then you're saying to yourself, well, this room doesn't exist, this character doesn't exist, she has no friend, so come on, who's going to believe this? And, you know, when you're, especially when you're starting out, this is you know, massive confidence problem. So you have to convince yourself that this room exists and so on. Uh, so largely I'll do enough research until I feel I have that confidence that I can bring the reader with me. Anyone else? Hello. Um, I understand from another article in The Spectator that you'd finished your book, but just too late for this September. Yeah. We're very sad about that. <laughs> Did you try to get the public publication date brought forward from a year later? Um, I, yes, I suggested um, that we might publish it in May, but um, my publisher assured me that if you 
publish in May, that's fine. But if you publish in September, you will just sell more. So, you know, I don't really understand why, because it'd still be in the shops in May, in September rather, and as long as it's in the shops coming up to Christmas, something like 90% of all books sold are sold in about a three-day period between the 16th and the 19th of December. So as long as it's there, you'd think it'd be all right. But, you know, you, I have a wonderful publisher, a very good editor. I've been with the same publisher all my life, and they've done a spectacularly brilliant job with some quite intractable material. I mean, imagine getting 700 pages of human traces on your desk. Crikey, Bill. So they know what they're doing, and they know better than I do. So I would have loved to come out in May, but they, they, they're the experts. You, um, you, you, you just gave us a tantalizing glimpse of this, uh, uh, of your book which is coming out next September, about the discussion about does history matter? Is it important to know why the Gar, gar I've just mis mispronounced it, Very Auschwitz, good. it's called the Gar, Auschwitz, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you perhaps expand on this a little bit? I mean, does it matter, does it, does it not matter? I will just say my, my 12 year old son who's very expensively educated, didn't seem to have heard of, the, heard of the Battle of Trafalgar, which I found rather alarming. <laughs> but does it matter? Does it matter? Huge question. He said it, he said it, he said it didn't matter, not in the syllabus. I'd be fascinated to hear your view. <laughs> well, I don't really want to have a view. I, w I want you to buy my book. <laughs> and I want you to make your own mind up as it, as it is dramatized between Hannah, my earnest know-all American researcher, and Tariq, my 19-year-old uh, runaway boy from um, a Muslim background in Morocco who knows nothing. But he, he just, he's the boy in the pinball machine. But he sees things that she doesn't. And she, in the end, becomes comes to rely on him slightly because she believes his naivete and his ignorance is, is, is in some ways a help to him. And she says to him at one point, I believe you see things I don't see, Tarek. It's because of the way you, you look at it. It's, it's because of your cultural ignorance. And he says, really? I thought it was because of the drugs. <laughs> and, but he's fascinated by the metro because he's never been on an underground uh, railway system before. And he loves all the names, but he hasn't the faintest idea what they mean. And he's one night he's getting rather drunk and he smoked quite a lot of weed as well with her grown-up friends who know everything. And he's banging on about Metro names. I love this, I love that. And he suddenly realizes that they're all laughing at him. And he's mentioned Etoile Charles de Gaulle. And he suddenly thinks, oh, God, what have I said? And he goes in and he thinks it's just a street names. And he goes into the loo with his phone. He looks at Etoile, which is called that because it has spokes radiating out from the Arc de Triomphe. Then he says, Charles de Gaulle, I, is that, is that, oh my God. And he suddenly realizes that Charles de Gaulle was, you know, really rather an important person in French history. And then he's so ashamed, he can barely go back and join the party. So this clash, this sort of culture clash between no wall and no nothing does have, I hope, some quite comic moments as well as some serious ones. Anyone else? Um, I'm wondering how much you have the structure of the novel in your head as you begin to write and how much the characters then take over as the plot thickens, so to speak. Um, I know where I'm going. Um, it's like setting off on a journey and I know I'm going from London to Naples and I know that I will stop in Paris, Geneva, um, Milan and Rome, but I don't know all the details of the routes in between. Uh, and, you know, it's, th that's one of the, to come back to your very first question, actually, I do love that. It's a push and a pull. It's a negative, a positive, a yin and a yang, whatever you want to do. I mean, all novelists will tell you the same thing. You, you, you've got to keep your characters under control, but you mustn't be a dictator. And if they want to go one way or another, I mean, in Human Traces, there was a, a character who was extensively psychoanalyzed over about 100 pages before, uh, and then operated on in a hospital. And she hadn't spoken a word for about 200 pages. And finally, I, she had to come in and sit up in bed and say something. And I had no idea what word was going to come out of this poor woman's mouth. But uh, luckily, 
she spoke clearly and in a nice, friendly and forgiving way to these terrible male doctors who messed her about so much. And consequently, you know, she gave a great energy to the book at that point, and you love characters who give energy to you. Um, but uh, so I think that's probably... Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I've forgotten. But that's, so it's, a, it's a mixture, and that's, that's part of the joy of it. Oh, yeah, actually, in the one I've just finished, the Paris book... Uh, this is what I was going to say. Uh, the main character, Hannah, the woman who I read out, her ruminating about her, her other half, you get a bit bored with just being in someone's head the whole time. So you, you have got to give them someone to talk to. So I just invented some random English bloke she knew from a few years ago, someone she could have dinner with, so we could hear her in dialogue, really, rather than just inside her head. It's a, it's a politeness to the reader, talking about helping the reader out, making it a sort of you know, collaborative thing. And then as the book went on, he asked her a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> and she was quite interesting back to him. And I found him becoming rather fond of her and her sort of warming to him slightly. And I suddenly thought, oh, gosh. So then I had to go back. And rather than just having him called X, the sort of, you know, random interlocutor, I had to sort of give him a bit of a character and, and build him up. So you have to do that a bit too. Good. Well, that's, we've reached the end of this. And now... Um, you're going, Sebastian is going to go and sign books in the bookshop. So go and buy his books. 